Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ingenious Talks Online, Enhancing Patient Collaboration in Healthcare. Thank you for joining us today. So my name is Laura Kilpatrick, and I'll be serving as the moderator for today's event. So while we meet today on a virtual platform, we would like to acknowledge the Algonquin Nation whose traditional and unceded territory we are gathered upon today. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and improving our own understanding of local Indigenous cultures and their peoples. Together, please consider how we are and can each, in our own way, try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Um, so we'll start with a few um, event items. So this is a Zoom webinar, which means that all attendee microphones and videos have been automatically disabled. However, you do have the option to ask questions by typing in the Q&A box on your screen. While questions will be answered um, at the conclusion of the presentation, we highly encourage you to type them as they come to mind into the Q&A box on your screen. So you do not need to wait until the question and answer period to submit your questions. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible, but please be mindful that with a high volume of questions, we cannot guarantee that all will be answered. So you may also type into the chat box on your screen to talk amongst each other and share ideas. Finally, a brief survey will appear on screen once you exit the webinar, and if you do have the time to fill it out, we really appreciate your feedback, and all answers are anonymous. So now I'm pleased to introduce to you our speaker for today, Dr. Fatima Rajabi. Dr. Rajabi is an assistant professor in the Department of Systems and Computer Engineering at Carleton University, where she initiated a new research group, the Health Fist Futures Lab, aimed at exploring how to design and develop innovative technologies to support increasing patient engagement in their medical care. Her research is funded by several Canadian federal granting agencies, including NCERT Discovery, NCERT Alliance, and the NRC Aging in Place. Prior to joining Carleton, Dr. Rajabi was a researcher in the Department of Surgery at McGill University Health Center. Today, Dr. Rajabi will discuss several projects in which her research team has designed and developed effective technologies and data visualization tools to help patients and healthcare providers increase patient engagement and provide means for collaborative collaboratively analyzing patient health data. Thank you, Dr. Rajabi, for joining us today. And now I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Laura, for the introduction. And I will start sharing my screen. Um, so yeah, and thank you very much for joining today for the talk. And um, I guess, good afternoon. Uh, we already passed the noon. Um, I'm Farma, and I'm today excited to talk about enhancing patient collaboration in healthcare using data visualization. And I quickly will touch on how to also enhance um, clinicians' um, collaborations. Since I joined Carton in January 2021, I've established a research group called HealthWiz and Futures. And in this research group, um, we conduct projects under three main areas of research, health, information visualization, and human-computer interaction. And some of the projects we do are um, solely in one area of research, as you can see, um, and like in the picture, and then some of them are interdisciplinary projects that are touching upon um, two or sometimes three of these three research areas. And all the work I do is thanks to my student in the lab who are, as you see, they're from different disciplines um, that I'm um, working in the lab together on different projects, uh, some from health, some from biomedical engineering, um, some master of applied science or system and computer engineering. Also, before I go any further, I'd like to acknowledge all the researchers who I worked with throughout my research, and I'm continuing to work with them um, in this journey. 
Okay, so to get started with the talk, um, this is um, what we will discuss today, um, how we can increase patient engagement in their care. Uh, we talk about communicating patient data with provider during clinical visits. And also we talk about how we can analyze patient data collaboratively with providers or between providers. And then we touch upon on a few takeaway messages um, that we can take from the, all the studies that we've conducted. As opposed to old days that we had um, since late 20th centuries, the patient's mindset have changed towards a model of active patient. The time that you would go to a doctor and follow their order as they said has really changed. And healthcare provider now also expect patient to be engaged in their care and not just be a follower or a listener. But what are the ways that patient can be engaged in their care? There are many ways, obviously, that um, patients we can get engaged in their care. They can look up information online. Um, we self-manage our health at home with a lot of um, technology we have in hand. Um, communicating during a clinical visit um, can be engaging, um, can be in a way that patient can be engaged in their care. Um, getting involved even during the hospital stay uh, throughout the recovery process, or also going back home after recovery and um, tracking um, the health status after. So all these ways the patient can get engaged um, they are possible, but it's really difficult to increase patient engagement in their health. Um, these strategies is not as easy as I'm just uh, listing them. They put extra pressure on patient's shoulder and it can introduce challenges for healthcare providers practices as well. Um, so here as designer of technology, we think technology can be a solution that facilitate these um, um, difficulties for both patients and physicians to increase patient engagement. The next question comes up here is that, okay, so how can we design effective technology by just throwing technology at people and trying to um, say that that can solve all their problem? Um, it's not really the best way. How can we design it in a way that can support both patients, but also healthcare providers? So here we borrow or we use a lot of methodology from discipline of human computer interaction. And this discipline is concerned with design, evaluation and implementation of interactive computing systems for human use, or as short, we call it HCI. And when I say computing systems, what do I mean here is could be a computing system, could be a software, um, it could be a user interface as its own, it could be a visualization system um, or any other form of computing system that we can design um, to help um, with enhancement of patient's engagement. The overall approach that we take in the lab is using people-centered design approach. And this is involving, um, basically you're solving a real world problem by involving people in the process of design. It's a very iterative process. It starts by discovering what people need or what is the challenges they are facing. And then um, fast prototyping or really quickly designing a solution, reflecting on the design again with having people in the loop and asking them, evaluating the design with them, and lastly, implementing the design. And as you can see in the picture, this process is not really a linear process. Um, they all fit each other, these um, phases fit each other, and you can go back and forth and um, modify the design. On the other hand, in the context of our research, we are very concerned with solving patients' problem. And to do so, we want to take a patient-centered care approach. And this care um, approach has been introduced in medicine um, quite recently, and it's a practice of caring for patient in a way that is meaningful and valuable to the individual patient. And it can actually include listening to patient, informing them, involving them in the care. So here we have these two methodology, one coming from the medicine, which is patient-centered care, and one coming from um, technology and computer science, which is people-centered care, uh, uh, people-centered design. We combine these two methodologies and we call it patient-centered design, basically designing iteratively where we put patient in the center of design and be involved in all processes. And this is what we take to answer a lot of the research questions that we have in the lab. 
So taking this approach, um, I have done several projects and um, a lot of projects are concerned with increasing patient engagement in their care. And today I'm gonna to focus on a few of them for this talk and then um, other projects and information about them are available on my website if you're interested to uh, dig a bit deeper. So one way to increase patient engagement is to improve communication in the clinic between physician and patient. Um, so when you actually go to your physician office and you sit there, how can we improve communication, sharing data um, in that uh, moment? So we started with this research question to explore the possibility of using visualization system as a medium that can facilitate communication between patient and provider during clinical visit. We divided this project into four phases, coming from that four um, phases of design, uh, people-centered design that I briefly showed before. Um, <clears throat> and I will go through each phase very quickly. We started this pro um, project by understanding how can we improve communication between patients and physicians. So we wanted to first study the communication challenges during clinical visits. We wanted to understand and tease apart how communication works to see the detail of challenges that patients feel when they go to see a physician and discuss their health. And this could be a specialist, it could be a medicine, family medicine doctor, any physician that patient may see. So we conducted a literature review and a series of interviews. We looked at different search engines um, for um, our literature review. And here it shows details of the process of the literature search we did, but basically the point is at the bottom when I show that there, are, there were, what we found was only 39 papers discussed these challenges of patients and physician communication challenges. And as if, if you um, look uh, on the provider perspective column, you see that there are only five papers that um, looked at in this challenge from provider's perspective, uh, either interview or observation. So mostly the papers were focused on patient's perspective. So to fill this gap, we wanted to um, go a bit further. We started conducting our own interviews with 10 healthcare providers and asked them about the interactions and the challenges they have when they talk with their patient. We compare these two studies. So we had the literature survey and we had the interviews. We started comparing and identifying similarities and differences um, between the opinion of um, about communication challenges from patients and physicians and perspective. As a result, we identified seven common causes of uh, communication challenges. And I kind of listed them here. You can see patients being anxious, um, physician using medical terminology, making communication a bit difficult, um, physician having, um, not having enough information or incomplete source of information about patients. So to understand, for example, one of them, um, mixing facts and emotion, that was a challenge that was brought up from both patients and uh, physicians' uh, perspective. But what does this mean? Patients often share a mix of emotions and facts when they see the providers. And providers are looking for factual information. I think we have been always, um, every one of us have been patient or at least been to a physician office um, and experienced um, some of these challenges and including sharing emotions. Um, sometimes patients think if they share emotions or mostly frustration with their condition, um, their condition may be taken more seriously. Um, so that's why they may share these. On the other hand, clinicians are looking for precise factual information, frequency, severity, because they are trained that way in medical school that they are trained um, to effectively interpret these medical history and establish a diagnosis and go from um, there to a treatment plan. So you can already see there is some conflicts here in the expectations of what um, patient one and one providers are expecting. 
And it was interesting because um, when they were both talking, patients and physicians were both talking about the same communication challenges um, that was brought up, the seven that we identified. But when we looked at the mid micro level, kind of like in the table that I showed um, in more depth, we saw that they had different opinions and attitude toward these challenges, and they saw the challenges from different um, angles or with different um, glasses. So we had this list of communication challenges um, to see which one we can focus on to um, address. We started talking with a series of healthcare provider and asking them about which one of these communication challenges dating um, should be addressed. And they were our collaborator for this project. And they pointed us to having an incomplete set of information as one of the pressing challenges that they are currently facing. Um, so we decided to focus on that challenge. And as you can see, there is a growth rate of patient collecting health data. Maybe you are also um, one of them, even not being a patient, um, Fitbit or other um, stuff um, or other type of watch that we have every day to collect our health data. And mostly patients want to understand their health better by collecting this data. Or sometimes they want to share these data with their healthcare provider, expecting to receive a more tailored medical advice than just a typical advice that any, let's say, hypertension patient would receive. The challenge is that in reality, when patients collect this health data over weeks or months, it turns into a very large and often very complex pile of data. So it's very challenging for clinicians to make sense of all this data in a short clinical visit. Often here in Canada, we have maybe um, seven to 10 minutes in average of a visit with physician, and also let's say make sense of their data and do a diagnosis and treatment plan. It doesn't really fit in that time frame. So we wanted to gain a better understanding of what are these characteristics of the patient data that they collect. Um, we went and interviewed eight patients who were chronically ill and they were collecting data for months and some of them for years. We asked them for a sample of their data collection and asked them about um, for a description of their data. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the way you analyze or share your data with your physician? This is a picture of the eight patients um, data that they collected and the form of data. And you can quickly see that how every each person chose in a different organization format and medium to collect their data. And we didn't really select these. Um, it was just happened to be like that, that. And we can see that the variety and diversity of um, patients using different things. Um, so some use their phone, um, some had notebook, um, some had Excel file, you can see. Um, so very different ways of collecting and presenting their health data. So if I summarize it, we can see that the result of our study showed that patients had unique needs, and that's why they collected different type of health data uh, and chosen different mediums um, and had individualized health stories that um, those type of data made sense to them. Here, the challenge is that um, what can we do with this data? As a visualization researcher, um, we decided to use visualization because we think visualization can have the capacity to summarize and accurately show data in a short matter of time, and it can be customizable. So can patients understand their data a little bit better? I can support them in communicating their data with their provider um, to uh, make sense of their data. Um, so we decided to visualize that data set that um, patient brought to their interview. Um, we heard their stories, we had a sample of their data, and we decided to do various individually tailored visualization for each patient. And this was possible because we had um, eight patients, and I will talk a little bit more about how we can go a bit further than just eight. So these are the results of what we did. There are hand-drawn visualization um, we did as the researcher um, based on the stories that patient told us, based on the data they brought up. And um, so there are eight columns, as you may um, see in the picture, and each person has different visualization. It's not even one for one person. Um, so we have a series of alternative visualization that are possible for that particular patient to select to showcase their data. So patients often share their data with their physician because they want to get their perspective um, or their opinion on, the, uh, the visual, on their data. 
So um, consequently, when we designed this visualization, we wanted to get the perspective of um, healthcare providers on our visualization and see what they think and if they think it's useful for their practices as well. We took this visualization um, to three healthcare providers with different specialty and asked about their opinion. We wanted to look into the reflection on the visualization that we designed um, and see how they can see these being useful in their practice or for their patient. So here it was interesting because we saw that, so clinicians saw value in having this visualization uh, for planning care for their patient. But we saw that previously patients were very different. Eight patients who had a very similar condition, they um, chosen different uh, mediums and they had different stories. Here we saw that physician also had varying practices and expectation when planning for patient care and how they saw this visualization be useful it was very different from each other, even between these three. To, okay, to kind of like showcase like this difference, which was very interesting. One uh, physician showed interest in having a holistic visualization view of all data items that a patient collects. They find that visualization that representing all data items in one view, very useful for planning mostly complex patients. So chronic patients who have, let's say diabetes and hypertension. So um, they said, you can see both changes in glucose and blood pressure. Um, it's one of those things that as a care provider, I can show that, yeah, during these times, these situations are really bad for you. Uh, so this physician was really interested in having a holistic view. On the other hand, another physician was excited about looking into patient data through a different lens to gain insightful direction for caring for patients. So what they said was, so over the years, I got used to this table. We never had any um, sort of visualization um, where there is the notion of same data, different lens uh, become useful, where the patient can look at their own data in different ways um, or different lens. And that's what they found um, useful, this um, particular position. So based on several phases of discussion and reflection we had with our healthcare provider collaborators, they chosen these four visualization that I'm um, showing in this picture as what they think it's valuable for implementation purposes and uh, they think it can be useful um, for patient and for their practice. So for this project, we are working with Alberta Health Services, uh, which uh, were, they were in the process of designing, developing the first patient-centered care plan in the province of Alberta for patients to manage their condition. As a result of this collaboration, I was also involved in designing part of this patient care plan and we incorporated the four visualization that was selected by healthcare provider to be implemented into this care plan website. Um, so this is the landing page of the website. It's called My Care Compass, and um, it's the first page. As you can see, there are several components. Um, you can track data, you can set goal or keep up with appointment, but you could also visualize your data um, based on all the studies that we did in our lab. Um, and <clears throat> currently, this platform is under evaluation by a selected group of patients um, to see what changes we can do um, make to make it better. So to summarize this project, we identified first what was patients and providers communication challenges. We um, went and designed a technology or visualization system that could be useful for them um, to showcase their data. And we discussed these with physicians and reflected on the design, chosen the appropriate design and facilitate technology transfer of the selected visualization into Alberta Health Services system. Um, so kind of like um, going a little bit more forward timing, um, we wanted to um, dig a bit deeper or dive deeper into other pathways that we can support patients and also physicians um, to visually analyze health data in a collaborative setting. Um, so not just showing it now, how can we help them to visually analyze it? 
Our objective was to explore possibilities of using visualization system. And here on shared surfaces, I will elaborate a little bit on more, uh, more on that to facilitate collaboratively reviewing and analyzing patient data. Um, and here, when I say collaboratively, it could be between patients and clinicians, or it could be between clinicians with different expertise. In a visit or in a clinical appointment between clinicians or between clinicians and patients, a large amount of data is exchanged. Uh, it could be laboratory results, imaging, um, CT scan, um, patient self-collected data, or treatment plans. So the question that comes to play here is um, visualization can accurately summarize patient data and help patients and providers understand their data. But how can we design these visualization very effectively to be able to analyze data and find detect, um, detect outlier, find patterns and trends in patients' data? To showcase this one, um, this um, research question, obviously it's a, a big research question, but um, one of the examples of the project that we did to answer partially this question, I'm going to touch upon it. Um, it's a recent uh, project going on with Breuer Hospital and with patients who are recovering from stroke in the hospital. Uh, so we want to design a visualization um, to showcase their progress for rehabilitation after stroke. So our um, goal, um, again, was to design a visualization for patients to be able to understand the recovery path. And we divided this project into four phases, which is ongoing right now. And first, we wanted to discover what is the challenges, what's the problem currently faced. This is the sample of data that is collected from patients when they are recovering after stroke. And um, we looked at the sample data, we interviewed clinicians who are caring for these patients in the hospital and asked them about the challenges they're facing or how they are tracking patients' progress and, pro and what is the process basically, and how do they measure progress. And you can see it's a very complicated data set, and which is, might be difficult to pass this to a patient to be able to understand them. But when we talked to clinicians, they wanted patients to know more about the recovery process. They wanted to look at their progress. Sometimes they verbally communicate that with, the, uh, with patients, but there is no medium currently to share that with patients because um, that Excel file I showed, um, I wouldn't say it's um, easy for someone to understand it. So we started to looking into how to design visualization to represent that data to patient that is a bit more effective and understandable. But these are some of the visualization samples that we um, designed and obviously work from my um, students in um, this project that they showed a summarized way of patient's data. And here you can see at glance or in a more um, effective way, more understandable um, what's happening as a patient. So you can see some of the tests that are done uh, to measure patient's uh, progress are shown here, a progress, for example, in three days or three months, how they are evolving. And this can be shared with a patient and, um, so that they can get motivation and they can have a better understanding of how their health is progressing. So right now we are in the process of selecting which one of these visualization design are best. And we are talking with physicians and um, asking the reflection on the design as well. And lastly, um, lastly, we'll go and ahead and do the implementation of them, hopefully. So I talked about all these visualization. The next question that comes to play is that, so we have these visualizations, but how can we show them and share them between patients and physicians? Um, you know, like you've been to the clinic office and current, like how they are currently. What are the technologies that we need? What are the clinical settings that we need to make these possible to use this visualization? What type of displays are most appropriate? Um, is a tablet okay, a phone, a laptop? How can we share these visualization um, interactive platform between patients and physician? I'm sure you've been to a physician office. Um, this is the most of the cases of the current technology they have. Um, the small, the screen, usually the monitor that is there is very small. Um, it's difficult for patient to view or even interact with it. Um, <clears throat> and even the data, the way it's displayed, um, how can you understand that? It's very difficult. Um, on the other hand, if patient decide to bring their own phone, let's say to show their data, 
the screen is small. There is no way for the physician to be able to fully in, um, interact with the uh, phone as well, as well as the patient, and imagine having a caregiver as well in present during the clinic visit. So these are the challenges. Um, but why not using current state-of-the-art technology to solve this problem of sharing data between patients and uh, physician and go a little bit um, above and uh, just not get stuck with the monitors, uh, desktop monitors, and use um, technologies that we have, for example, tabletops and interactive tabletops that we have. So here at Carton, we um, purchased an interactive tabletop display. It's 55 inches. Um, it's multi-touch, meaning that uh, many people can touch at the same time. And this particular technology allows for as many people as we want to touch the screen and be able to interact with it. And <clears throat> it goes on the uh, kind of like a desk or table underneath it. Um, it has the possibility to go up and down. So it can uh, um, be accommodating person with a wheelchair um, if, that's the, uh, if um, that's the situation for the patient. And uh, also the angle changes. So you can see I put it in an angle, but it can be um, zero degree or 90 degree. Um, so it can serve as a table that patient's data sh are shown on it and both patients and physician can see it at the same time. In the future, um, one of our goal is to install large interactive services um, on the wall as well to allow for more people to collaborate and review patients' data. So not just be um, stuck or limited to the tabletop, but also on the wall, uh, they can walk up to their data and talk about it. And this can also allow for multiple clinicians to be in the room um, to either with the presence of the patient or um, without the patient. So along, along this line, one of the ongoing research projects we are doing is we are looking into um, treatment plan for patients with heart condition. Um, so here again, there is a lot of data modality that needs to be taken into account for planning, let's say, surgery or treatment plan for heart condition. Um, this is on the side of the clinicians, um, but the problem is there's a lot of data. How can we make sense of it? What do we need? Um, so these are some type of data, for example, examples of the type of data that clinicians need to take into account uh, for planning surgery for um, cardiac surgery. Uh, so it could be an x-ray, CT scan, nuclear imaging, um, and heart rate, um, and all those other um, data that they may need. And multiple clinicians sometimes need to be involved. Um, so there's a um, kind of two level of challenges here. Different type of clinician that need to be involved and also several sources of patient data that needs to be present for um, doing this planning. Um, so how can we make this um, easier? And can we use the large services that I mentioned and with the uh, power of visualization to make this planning easier? So we are developing a tool um, that uses multimodality image fusion, uh, bringing all this um, imaging, x-ray, CT scan into one visualization to facilitate uh, treatment planning. Uh, so you can see on the left, it's the polar map of the left ventricle of the heart. And the color that are used here encode information about the heart muscle and each in the, each section of the heart. Um, polar map is basically looking on the map of the earth from North Pole and versus the 3D scene that you can see on the right, it's like a globe. So you can see the heart or kind of like a shape of the heart. Um, and it can help physician um, to more accurately plan for cardiac surgery um, between themselves. So a future directions that we are uh, looking into is to test how can we use these large surfaces to accommodate this large data um, and also the visualization and have many people at the same time helping with making decision um, based on the data that we have in hand. So to kind of conclude, um, from all the studies um, I've done and we've done in the, in the lab, we showed the results showed us that each patient is different. It's very, they're unique. They have unique body and highly individualized lifestyle. And providers also have various practices and expectations when plan, uh, planning for patient care. So we need to propose technology that 
are considering these individualities. Um, we go to a clinician office, we don't expect to get the same medication or same treatment as even if we have same, let's say, condition as another physician, uh, as another patient. Um, so we have to apply that understanding to our technology design as well, and um, go a little bit beyond just um, designing a technology for the general public that can serve everybody. Um, so I see great potential and interest from patients um, to use technology, but it needs to be um, designed in a way that can be tailored to their needs um, and also the physician's needs. So I would like to end uh, with the stage four kidney cancer survivor and advocate patient engagement code. Um, so David DeBroncar, uh, and he calls himself ePatient Dave, and he has a very nice co code that um, elaborates on why patient and how patient really want to be engaged in their care. He says, I'm an ePatient, equipped, enabled, empowered, engaged. I am no clinician, but I do everything in my power to help them to play an active role in my own care, even in the design of care. And with that, I would like to end the um, talk and thank you very much for listening. And if you have any question, happy to answer. I hope you enjoyed. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Rajabi, for that great presentation. Um, so we'll move on to the question and answer period. Um, so we do see that we have a few questions, but if you do have a question, feel free to type it um, into the Q&A box. So that should be at the bottom of your screen and we'll try to get to it, okay? Mm -hmm. um, all right, so first question. Um, do your visualization models allow data on social determinants of health to be shared also? Um, I think it um, so the visualization models um, would be yeah um, possible to do that. It depends if we have access to the data. So I'm not sure if I understood the question. Like, um, if the patient bringing this data with themselves, um, we can think about how we can incorporate that into that. Um, let's say like, or if they bring in some other context. So we had patients who were collecting um, blood pressure data, but also writing down some notes as well about why they feel like this type, um, they are experiencing that um, blood pressure numbers. Um, so we try to incorporate that as well into the visualization to have some context um, aligned or assigned um, to the data. So it's not just numbers, if I understood the question correctly. Thank you for that. All right, next question. So how do you balance the design of visualizations to serve both patients and clinicians? Um, yeah, so that is tough because um, we see that sometimes they have very different goals. Um, we think that there is same goal because they want the patient to be um, cured or treated, um, but they come from very different perspectives. Um, patient um, may want to sometimes even take into account um, other um, events in their life that, for example, they don't want to be on medication that makes them sleepy because they want to attend such events or such event, uh, versus the physician want them to be um, treated. So that's what maybe um, the goal that they have. And um, so it's very difficult. Um, sometimes the visualization with design have two uh, views. Uh, so there is a view that only targeted toward patients. Um, they can manipulate it on their own. And there is a view for physician, which sometimes also have a bit more detailed um, data, more detailed information available incorporated in it. Um, so that could be one potential solution. Or um, sometimes we let patient create their own report that they want to share with the physician. Um, so not necessarily just their own view, but it's something that they want to share and they get their perspective. So ability to customize um, the visualization is also something that we always take into account when we design these. I hope that answer. Great, thank you. Um, from Sheila, so are clinicians generally open to finding new ways to present or share data with patients?
I guess I was on mute, sorry. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, so they are open to um, look at these visualization, um, which is interesting. And um, they really want patient's data now because um, maybe 10 years ago, they were overwhelmed and they didn't want to look at all this data because they were already um, you know, pressed for time. Um, now they're a bit more open to look at this data and they, I think they are seeing advantage of looking at patient's data more than just what they get in the lab. And um, at least the physician that I had interaction with, they were open to see this visualization because they don't find all these tables and all this um, maybe unorganized patient data collected very useful. Um, so they see visualization as a way that can um, be um, helping them. And it may take a little bit of time, but it's interesting because when I interviewed a few physicians and I showed them the visualization, um, at first they were not very receptive, but um, slowly they're starting to get the point. And um, then they got very much on board and they really wanted it to be incorporated into um, their healthcare services um, and systems. Um, so it may take a little bit of time, I guess, to for them to be able to understand how they can make use of it. Um, but I had at least great success in them accepting these. Great, that's fantastic to hear. Um, all right, so next up, um, so there, I'm a second year biomedical and electrical engineering student, and I have a background in healthcare. Your research falls along the lines of the type of work I'm interested in. Is it possible to somehow get involved? Oh, yes, um, uh, definitely. Um, I shared my email address here, and this is the website for um, the lab. Um, I have, I think right now, three or four undergraduate students who are working in the lab as well. So always happy to have uh, more students who are interested in health and engineering because, um, yeah, interaction uh, between these two are um, super interesting to me. So yeah, please get in touch. Uh, we can uh, talk more. Great. All right, next question. Um, so what are the challenges of working with patients and clinicians in the design process? Um, yeah, it's, it is very challenging uh, because patients are obviously sick. Um, so getting their time is difficult. Uh, they already are um, spending time on, uh, let's say their own um, health condition. Physician on the other side also um, very busy. How do we get their time? That's one challenge. Also, how to get the interest. So going back to one of the questions that were raised, um, are they really interested or do they see really value? Because sometimes imagining how technology can be useful for you um, might not be straightforward. So you, um, they may not see value. Um, so that these are a little bit challenging and how we can um, have them along the way in the design process, because these processes take time. Like it might take a year or two to be able to design something effectively. Um, so having them on board throughout the whole um, you know, term of the project, it might be difficult. Um, but slowly, I think we um, sometimes when I show them some of these sketches of preliminary designs, uh, they get more excited and they are more willing to participate in the future studies to help us with the um, design. Um, so yeah, kind of like um, trying to have them on board um, and showing the value, um, I think that would help as well. All right, um, next question, so from Franklin. Uh, would visualizations be tempered to the patient's progression or digression? For example, would the visualizations be changed for a patient with declining health? Um, so we show how patients are evolving um, through the visualization. One thing we are very careful about in the design is not to discourage them. Because if someone is obviously um, not progressing as much as they want, or um, they're going negatively in terms of their health is declining, um, you don't want to show them, but you don't uh, like discourage them, but you don't want to also lie, right? I mean, so you want to show the case, their da the data um, are exactly the data, but you don't want to be discouraging them. Um, so it's very tricky way um, or tricky to design a visit that 
can um, serve both purposes. Uh, what we do a lot is um, pay attention to coloring. Uh, for example, the type of color that we use, the language that we use um, in the visualization, even in the labels, in simple labeling, um, to make sure that we are not um, driving a message that is too negative. Um, but we also show that. So um, if it's if the patient is uh, declining or not doing as well as the uh, physicians are expecting, um, we also show that in the visualization with care. I would say that's uh, as much as we can do, I guess. Interesting. Um, next question. Um, how important is the interaction component in these visualizations and how deep should or can the interactivity go? Um, so most of the visualization we design are interactive. We start with sketches that are not interactive, obviously. Um, so on piece of paper, uh, and then we go to the interaction. Interaction is important because the data usually is very large and crowded and complex. If we don't have interaction, we cannot simply show all the data in one view and be able to understand good information, insightful information. Um, so we have we really need interaction in here. And I think interaction is a possibility to um, be able to um, dig a bit in the data and be able to find um, some outliers or some trends that's um, mostly possible when you have interaction and you have the possibility to play around, let's say, with the data and to see, oh, if I change that factor, how do I see change in this, um, let's say, health condition or in this um, health value? Um, so we really, really depend on interaction, let's say, in here um, because of these two problems, being complex data, large data, and also being uh, wanting to be able to analyze the data and not just have it as an infographic um, as, as is, let's say. Right, next question from Jesse. So in my own research, I've seen patients report negative experiences when attempting to share knowledge, data, or research with their own uh, care providers. And sometimes, I need to manage doctors' feelings in order to get treatment. Can these visualizations help foster more trust between patients and physicians and respect for patient knowledge? Yeah, that's actually a, um, a very nice uh, experience. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we are hoping because I think the raw data um, sometimes may be discouraging or it can be like too much. And maybe that's one of the reasons that the physicians are a little bit negative toward them because um, there's too much data, they don't have time, they're under the pressure um, to communicate everything to the patient at this, uh, at just that five, 10 minutes that they have. So we are hoping that the visualization can foster this and, and like kind of like smoothen these communication between the two parties. and. The ability to interact with the visualization can also maybe help a little bit here um, because I think a lot of the time um, you want to say a message to your physician, um, but you want to showcase it in a way that um, they understand and also um, you like you rely heavily on your data. Um, so being able to show it visually and also at the same time being able to interact with it and show it to your physician, let's say, if I have this um, condition or like if I take um, cake in this day, then I have a stomach ache on those days. Um, so you can show that with visualization. Hopefully that would be somewhere um, to foster this communication and um, make it a little bit easier. And that's the goal. Um, so staying away from the raw data and having it visually, um, we are hoping that could be helpful. Um, in the studies we've done, um, showed that it was helpful. Obviously, yeah, I can't say it's going to work for everybody, uh, but that's, let's say, a tool that we would like to give to the patient um, to be um, armed with it when they go to the physician office. And hey, Thank you. Um, next question is from Ali. So were the patients you interviewed a representative sample of different age groups? 
Yes. Um, so the patients are interviewed. Um, there were some who were very young, um, 30, um, around, the, around 30. I had in 40 or 50, and even um, older in 60s or 50s. Um, I also recently conducted the study with patients over 65 who had um, um, osteoporosis and problem with um, fraction as well. So I've done um, a big range of um, patients age group. Um, I think that mindset that, I don't know if that was the message of the question, but mindset that the patients who are older may not want to use technology is changing. And now a lot of older patients are also receptive to using technology, using these visualizations. And um, one of the studies I did, that was the oldest patient I had, she was giving me a lot of ideas. Oh, can you change this view to this? Um, then that would be super useful for me. I think it depends on how much patients want to be engaged in their own care, um, more than age, um, I would say. Uh, and we care for these things because when we design, we care that the patient, if they are for an older generation or um, they may have like, you know, visual uh, impairment, they may have um, hearing problems. Um, so we care for these when we are designing for them, like with size of the menu, with the coloring chosen, uh, choosing like colorblind safe colors, like all these things, we take them into account when we design these visualization for a particular population, um, particularly if they're older. Great, thank you. Um, so what is the typical turnaround time? So how long for a new problem to a useful information um, or to get the information for the patient and for the provider? So if I understand the question, turnaround time for the project, um, it's quite long. Uh, as you can see, all of these projects have um, different um, phases. Um, so we, um, in these four phases, for example, is our, um, each take a long time to interview, to do um, all this design and go back and fix them. Uh, so a year between a year or three years, um, we take depending on how deep we want to go like into the integration and for example the project I did with Alberta Health Services um, took around three to four years to finish the whole thing and uh, because we do a lot of iterative design going back and forth um, and modifying it that's also taking a long time uh, smaller project between one or two years I would say great thank you um, next question is from Ross. So can you describe how visualization could help patients, physicians, and physiotherapists to track progress um, after, for instance, spinal fusion or knee replacement surgeries? Mm -hmm. um, I, I worked with a lot of um, physiotherapists and the patient after fracture um, or patient after surgery. Um, in these cases, the most useful, I, I can see visualization would be to track progress. So a lot of times patients are given um, questionnaire or PRO, patient reported outcomes to fill out after their surgery. Um, so they ask them, fill this out every three days or fill this out every um, week um, to see the progress. So here, these questions are often long and they're, they give you a score. I'm not sure if this really understandable score, something out of 50, for example, what does it mean? Is it better if I'm 49 or is it better if I need to be one as a patient? Um, so here visualization can be helpful. Like, you know, we can simply show that with a color code encoding, um, how you are progressing and if it's good progress or bad progress, or like you're not, like you're inclining, for example. Uh, that's one uh, way. Another way that we help uh, patients is particularly after um, ortho surgery was to design, a, we designed an app that showcased how, um, like basically helped patient with their medication after surgery, because ortho surgeries are very painful. And after the surgery, patients are experiencing a lot of pain. Um, with all these fears of using opioid, then patients are not very like willing to take opioid because they think they may get addicted. Um, so they stay back. And then what happens is they get um, this um, 
acute pain turns into chronic pain. Um, so that's what the physician wants to avoid. What we did was we designed an app that patient can go there and track their um, the medication they're taking every day, the level of pain and how the other kind of like some other factors of recovery that they are going through. Based on that, obviously we work with a lot of clinicians in that and um, with the regulations from um, Osteoporosis Network of Canada, how we kind of gave them recommendation on the medication they should take or how they can um, help themselves. So there are uh, ways that to reduce pain, for example, take a, a cold bath, all these things that are established in the clinicians um, in the clinical literature. Um, so the app gives them advice based on how they are doing right now after surgery. And, and we are testing that as well with physicians uh, and also with patients. Uh, and hopefully we're going to um, have a clinical trial um, testing if patients who had access to this mobile phone had better experience after surgery versus patients who didn't have um, the phone and were just um, not sure what to do because you go to your pharmacy and they give you the medication that were prescribed. And, and there are some instructions, but sometimes it's very difficult to follow the instructions of when do I need to get up to take the opioid? When do I need to take just acinephan? Uh, so this app will, can be helpful for those patients. Really interesting. Um, our, so our last question. So for a general health condition, how long would the patient need to collect data to make visualization an effective tool for the physician? Mm -hmm. that, um, that's a good question. So um, most of the visualization I showed today are for the patients who have a longer term condition. So a lot of them are chronic uh, and unfortunately um, that they are experiencing that for a lifetime or a very long period of time. Um, Visualization that we did, for example, for patients after a surgery uh, was for a shorter period of time. Um, so we can tailor the visualization depending on the term, um, but it's not going to be per se useful for if I have a leg fracture or broken leg and I go to emergency room and just get it cast and come back home, um, not maybe so useful and maybe in a week it's all good. Um, it's more for helping them with longer term. Um, although with the fracture for older adults, because that's a little bit, um, or and also surgery, uh, when we designed the app, um, we um, also worked a little bit on the visualization of it. We tried to visualize their data and a summary of their uh, pain. Um, over let's say days or um, because we asked them to track their pain every day, few times per day. So it depends um, really if you have, it's, it's like, do you have data basically that you're collecting um, for that particular condition um, that can be visualized. Um, different methods for visualizing it, if it's a smaller data set and it's shorter period of time, um, than if it's a long-term disease like a hypertension that this person is experiencing for over years. Um, and how and it's kind of like techniques to use and um, do we show an overview? Do we show every single data? Um, these things that come to play and kind of we have to make decisions on that based on the term of their conditions and how long it is. Uh, so we can obviously help. Um, has to be um, like we have to interview them and see what are the conditions and how um, what are the things that we need to take into account for this particular visualization for their condition. Great. Well, that was quite um, the session today. Thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Rajabi. I hope that everyone enjoyed um, the session and got some useful information and insight into her research. Thank you so um, much for the invite. And thanks for welcome. all the questions. <laughs> yeah, lots of questions came up. So even if your question didn't get answered, we'll make sure to pass those on to Dr. Rajabi. Um, I see that quite a few have asked if a recording will be available post-event. Um, so we'll just pop that into the chat. Um, so that's where you can find the recording. Um, it won't be up immediately, but I would say check within a few days. Um, also, here are other ways to stay connected with the Faculty of Engineering and Design, so through our website uh, and social media. And if you haven't yet, um, through that link that I put into the chat, you can sign up for our mailing list. 
um, so that way you can hear about our upcoming talks and sessions like that. Once this concludes, you will be able to answer a survey um, on your screen. So if you do have the time to fill that out, it would be much appreciated. And all answers there are anonymous. So thank you for joining us today and hope to see you again in the future. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.